Words of Truth and Soberness is the title of today's message for us, taken from Acts 26, 21 to 32. The Christian is constrained by love to preach the gospel in the exacting of our zeal to share the gospel, we expect two responses that the Apostle Paul, in all his experience, shares with us when he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God the value in which the people of God awakened to the perils of their souls has upon this message of the gospel would be very different from the world at large and also from the Christian through the age, through the church age that has been lukewarm. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. We realize that spiritual things are given by God. The Holy Spirit has to bring the word that is spoken, the word of God that is spoken, to convict the heart. And God has to overrule and indeed he will now we have not received the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God this work of the gospel is of God and you see that the natural man the Bible says receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Have you preached the gospel to someone who would just turn a deaf ear to your uh, pleading, to your persuasion? You see the peril that is confronting that soul. And in the earnest of your heart, in the desire of your heart to make a difference in the person's life, you speak. And yet, you see a cold response. Somehow the heart is not touched. It's hard as a stone. And we realize that this does not deter us. It must not discourage us. Because salvation is of the Lord. It is our responsibility to share and sometimes you would find that in your sharing, in your zeal to give the word, I, uh, as in the experience of the Apostle Paul, uh, he, he is called by Festus as a madman. Have you had anyone who would tell you that because of your zeal to share the gospel? Someone said, you must be crazy. Why are you keep?" Why are you keeping, keep harping on this message of the gospel? You see, we see by the spiritual eyes that God gives to us that there is a heaven and hell difference. And we are noting the perils that are confronting that soul. That's why we are so concerned. That's why the message is so urgent. They may just struck and reject the call to be connected with their maker. But to us, the gospel is the truth. It is the truth because God has freed us from the bondage of sin. We can feel it. We know it in our lives, whereas previously we lived like that. But now, you see, we live differently. The power of the gospel 
has taken in roots in our hearts, in our life, and we are seeing a change. We are seeing the fruit of grace manifesting itself in our lives, and we see its benefits, its true worth. And that is why we share it with others. That's why we are touched by the love of God, by the power of God in our own lives. And we have that strength to overcome even the insult of being called a mad man. You're willing to humbly take it. You're willing to humbly receive it. Because you know that this message of the gospel is precious and urgent and needful. Jesus said to the Pharisee called Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. John chapter 3. And Jesus said, to him, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus then used the illustration of the wind to help us to understand the work of the Holy Spirit in the conversion of the soul. Jesus says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it come, or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus tried to help us to see spiritual things by a physical illustration. We have all been, at some point in time, uh, flown a kite. And we all know that to fly a kite, you need the wind. When you have the wind, you know the kite will be lifted up into the air. You cannot see the wind, but you can understand right, the nature and the power of the wind that is propelling the kite right, in the heights. Right, when it goes up, you know that the wind is there. You cannot see it, but you can feel it, and you can see its presence. The Apostle Paul is not a madman. The gospel uh, is not uh, fun and games in the sense. It is a costly thing to be involved in the work of the gospel. It is a costly thing to have an auditorium like this. To come together, we have to take time, we have to prepare and we have to make our way. But we know the worth of it. We know how it is helpful in our lives. And Jesus explained, tried to explain this spiritual life to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus finally understood. And when you take hold of God in your life, well, you, don't, you won't let go of it. Because you know that this life is meaningful. And the world, the things of the world would fade away. I remember before my conversion, we are used to listen to the music of the world. And you follow the trends. But after the conversion, how is it that the words of spiritual songs and hymns become meaningful and how they take a, the, the, the music of the world take a backstage in your life. How is it that that desire goes away? How is it that the appetite for the things of the world wanes itself in your life? Well, you have seen uh, a, a, a change. God has by His Spirit, make a change to help you to see the things that are meaningful, that count for eternity. You have a different perspective. Life is no longer this three-dimensional 
existence. Eat, drink, and be merry. Right? This is what uh, Jesus said to the, the people, right? uh, his disciples. He says that the days prior to Christ coming again would be like that. You focus on eating, drinking, and being merry, the party spirit. But the Lord tells us that we are to focus. Focus on the things that matters. Focus on the Word of God. Focus on the things that would help us to grow spiritually. And if we have a wrong focus in our life, you'll find that well, the spiritual life doesn't grow. And it's sad to see right, years and years and and this is what the Apostle Paul is doing. He was trying uh, his utmost to try to do something so that there would be a change in the hearts, in the lives of the people he hoped to touch with the gospel. And uh, Festus in verse 24 of our text intervened when he tried to convert as it were, King Agrippa. He intervened, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning does make thee mad. And he had to defend himself. He had to speak and said that I speak words of truth and soberness with intellectual soundness, with rationality. It is for your spiritual well-being. It's reasonable. It makes good sense if you think of it carefully. Take away the pride. Take away the hindrances. And consider carefully what we are talking about. So Paul said to Festus, I am not mad. Most noble Festus, verse 25, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He asked the king to open his eyes and see the glory of God. He says that this message is not far-fetched. And uh, you see, the king, <clears throat> he had to further emphasize right? you know every time you are in a witnessing situation right? you are in a spiritual battle and Paul said for the king knoweth these things before whom also verse 26 I speak freely for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in the corner he says that this gospel is a truth and he can concretely understand by the eyewitnesses and record of Christ's crucifixion and death and his subsequent resurrection. In other words, he's saying, you reject it out of sheer stubbornness. Let us not be stiff-necked. Right? If one will not be persuaded to the benefits and reality of the gospel, then look at the conversions that has taken place. Right now we are at Acts 26. Since Pentecost, how many men has been saved? 3,000, 5,000, when the Spirit of God came, men were converted. And during those times, Paul, uh, it, it, is it not true? And Paul himself stands as a witness. He says that you know who I am before I become a Christian and you know who am I now. The God of heaven has intervened in my life. There has been a turnaround in my life. Do you not know what has taken place in the last 40 years in this holy land? The God from heaven has come. I just take one simple account from Matthew 9, verse 27. Jesus healing the two blind men. 
The two blind men followed him, crying, said, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he came into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And your eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it, but they when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. This is what Jesus did. And case after case, person after person, he healed. He helped. So many eyewitness examples of the glory of God, of the power of God, all these things are not done in the corner, Paul is saying. You all see it. You have experienced the power of God. You have seen the miracles. Don't spurn it. Don't take for granted. Don't spoil the goodness of God that He has given to you. Submit to the order of God. The power of God that was unleashed. Many were saved and healed. There was no lack of testimony to God's power. And as you think of it, Paul was continuing that work. Two thoughts that we want to think about. As you think about this man, Paul, now we are at chapter 26. His life is you know, he's physically broken, as it were. Because he has gone through much, much suffering in order to bring the gospel to many. And there are those who still take for granted. Isn't it true in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ do you not see the scars? Do you not see the marks of the sufferings that Christ suffered in his life? Will you not see what Christ did? And you look at the Apostle Paul, you will understand from this man that he means business for the Lord. He's not here on his own accord. Because he thinks, he thinks it is a, a good thing right, to be imprisoned and do this work of the gospel. But he is constrained by the love of God, constrained by the call of God. He knew that there is, this is the best for his life. And so we want to examine as we think Consider this text, his purpose from verses 21 to 25 and, his, and the persuasion, how he was unwavering in persuading, in trying to bring the gospel to the people. Verse 21, for this causes... Paul says, because he was obedient to the heavenly vision that God gave to him, that the Jews caught him in the temple and went about to kill him. Verse 21 says, having therefore obtained help of God, he says, I continue unto this day. So he says that his work in the gospel is not man-made. It's not self-determined. It's by the will of God. It was for the purpose of God that he is there, that he has to spend two years in prison. And God was with him. He is saying that. How could a man survive what he has survived? 
do what he has done except for the grace of God. Well, you remember, he was to be killed. And then they realized that he was a Roman citizen. God saw to it that he was a Roman citizen so that he would be protected. He could appeal, appeal to Caesar. He cannot be charged without trial. He has the opportunity to defend himself. So you see, God was there to help him. And then God protected him. They wanted to kill him in Jerusalem, you remember? When he tell them, repent of your sins. That's not easy to tell, say to someone in the eye, repent of your sins, you know. They are going to eat you up. They are going to rebel and they are going to do what they can to corner you. And the Apostle Paul was prepared to go all the way. He will not relent because he know that it is for their soul's comfort. It's their soul's well-being. Not for himself. If it's for himself, he, he, he could have... Uh, had an easier life. And then God also protected him. Remember? There was a castle, a Roman castle there uh, in Jerusalem whereby the Roman commander quickly pulled him in and kept him protected there in that castle. And while he was there, the Jews plotted 40 of them with a vow and a fast that they would kill him. And what did he do? Well, the, the truth was given to his nephew, the sister's son. And what did he do? Well, he came and told the Apostle Paul, and Paul told it to the Roman commander. And the Roman commander quickly by night by a garrison of soldiers, ushered him away from Jerusalem to Caesarea. That's why he's there. That's why he wrote and he said, you know, I've obtained help of God. God was there for me. I'm not doing this on my own. So beware of that. And be careful who you're meddling with. He, has, he was fulfilling the purpose of God for his life to witness a good confession of the faith that God has given to him, small and great. His mission was very clear, to share the gospel for the conversion of such as will believe. And he admitted that it is an uphill task the people don't want the message. And he shared this when he was writing the epistle to the Romans concerning his own countrymen. He said in Romans chapter 10, in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be safe. And I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And he whom God had opened the spiritual eyes cannot but declare to them, do you know that this Messiah is the Christ? This is Jesus, the one who has suffered for you. You have been ignorant, he says, of God's righteousness and you have sought to establish your own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So he had to explain to them, this is what he's doing. The end of the law for righteousness is Christ, to whom we believe that is righteousness. Faith in the Christ. And he tells them that 
there is a way out. God's word that is preached will bring faith to the heart that souls will be converted and he learned he knew God said to him for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture saith whosoever believeth of him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord is over all is rich unto all that will call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved God has showed him the way to God through Jesus Christ that heavenly vision and he knew that this is what he must do so he wrote Romans 10 I would say a word of lamentation <laughs> how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace that bring glad tidings of good things you look at the feet of the apostle paul it is rough with colors colossus he has been chained up in prison many many days in the dungeon many many days those feet were not you know beautiful to look at right you look at the our lord jesus when he in his resurrected body what do you see you see the scars you see the marks you see the sacrifice this is what Paul is saying to them he wants them to understand the purpose of God for their salvation and it's serious business and so he says to them that God has a purpose and God has revealed to me his purpose for you that you might be saved and this was what he was doing to persuade them and then he would go on verse 26 to 32 in persuading and King Agrippa says that he you know was persuaded well, the text there tells us that he was convicted in his heart you see Festus quickly intervening you know when you share the gospel have you experienced the situation when you know just at the critical moment right, something comes to obstruct hinder well this is what is going on in the heavenlies the battle is going on for the soul Festus tried to intervene with Paul so that a King Agrippa will not be put on the spot because of all the what the persuasive power of a spirit filled believer the Spirit of God came into him dynamite power He was convincing King Agrippa, declaring the truth of the gospel, not as a madman, but with dignity and sobriety. This was what he was doing. Somehow, you would see 
it is difficult to belittle, to scorn, to ridicule a man of real devotion. This was what Paul was showing to them. That he means business. That this gospel is real. And he's pouring out his life even unto death in sharing with them the gospel. This was what he was doing. There was a university chancellor many years back in the University of Glasgow who introduced a man, a missionary. His name was called David Livingston. He was a missionary for the Lord in the jungles of Africa. And as he was being introduced, if you would read the account of the record, you would be able to see how the students fixed upon him. They look at him. His hair was burned crisp. The account gave under the torrid tropical sun. His body wasted, emaciated with jungle fever. His right arm hanging limb at his side, destroyed by an attacking ferocious lion. And the book said, when the students looked at him, they stood up in awe and silence before God's missionary. There is power in a consecrated life. There is power in a devoted life that gripped the human heart, that makes it difficult to belittle and to ridicule. This was the Apostle Paul's life. This was the life of Jesus Christ. When he was at Gethsemane, he agonized. His sweat were as blood. Paul said to the Galatian church, Galatians 6, 17. You see, the, 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 the attack upon his apostleship was so great, he had to defend himself. And what did he say to them? He said, look at these marks, these scars that is in my body. He tells them. He showed them what happened in his life. There was no false apostle. And they will say to him that you're not real apostle. The apostles only 12. How would you classify, qualify? You claim you have seen Jesus. You have received the heavenly message. It's not true. It's a heresy. They tried to dilute the message, dilute his ministry. And Paul had to defend his apostleship. He says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. This is what the apostle Paul was doing when he was before Agrippa. You remember when he was... Uh, and his first missionary journey, he was in Lystra, Acts chapter 14, we studied. How he was stoned. He says in Acts 14, 
Once was I stoned at Lystra and dragged out of the city for dead. And it says, five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Thrice I was bitten with Roman rods. So if they, have, if they would have opened, you know, you, you would have showed them his body, they would have seen the scars that were all over him. He had a testimony in prisons, he said, above measure. He was thrown and cast into prison many times. He said the Lord was with him, but he had to suffer prison life. And this was how he was persuading them. It was a work of sacrifice. It is no mean work. We don't enter into it easily. We have counted the cost, in other words. This is what Paul is saying to them as he stood before King Agrippa. As a prisoner, two years he was there. I spent two years in prison. The kind of food, the kind of environment that you're in, not so good. This was how he was persuading them. This was how he was speaking to them. What was he doing? He was telling them to repent of their sins. Not an easy message to give. And he had to persuade them. He had to tell them what's good. His desire is that all who hear him will be saved. Born again. And he says in verse 29, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except this bonds. You hope that all of them will be saved. All who hear him will be saved. He tells them that I don't want you to be like me, to be a prisoner. You know, being a Christian doesn't mean that you have to go to prison like me. Your life may be spared. You may have a better life than what I'm doing. That's his that's God's will for his life. And so he said to them, he does not want them to be blasphemous like him, trusting in their own righteousness, persecuting the saints, hurting the Christians. And so this was what the Apostle Paul was doing. And you'd find that God will... God has given you a spiritual mandate to be his witnesses. And how are we faring? You know, Paul always said in every one of the epistles that he is a born slave to Jesus Christ. He's a servant. He's a born slave to Jesus Christ. And in the Roman Empire at that time, you know, statistics has it that perhaps there's about 100 million in the population and 60 million will be slaves. Big group. Everywhere he goes, he would see slaves. And how does the master keep their slaves? They would scar them make a mark 
on them so that they cannot run away. A deep mark. That's the meaning of the word scar, you know, that Paul used to describe who he was. He was a born slave to Jesus Christ. But he was a willing slave. He was serving his Lord, bearing the cross. Have we been bearing our crosses, our fair share of the cross in our life? That's the question that we ask ourselves as we look into this passage. Now look at this man. Look at his life. Look at the devotion. Look at what God had put in his heart. And he knew right, that you know, he's going to go to Rome. Right? Jesus said to him in Acts 23, 11, you have testified for me in Jerusalem, now you're going to Rome. And I will send you there. And the king and the governor, verse 30 of our text says, excuse themselves, they gone aside and they talked between themselves. And what did they say? This man, what? Doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. He says to them that there is no reason to incarcerate him. He was innocent. Festus kept him there because Festus was hoping for a bribe from the Jews. Acts 24, 26. And Festus well, had a different agenda, but all for the glory of God. God knew what is going on. And the Lord indeed was leading his people, saving souls into his kingdom. And we realize that as we look at the church and how, you know, why churches are, seem to be so weak and powerless. Well, it's, it's because there is that lack of devotion. The hearts are not burdened. The hearts are not praying. Many prayers are unprayed. Many testimonies are not spoken, given. Many unoffered gifts. No devotion, lack of devotion. We give the Lord our leftover. We give the Lord that which doesn't cost us anything. And we are comfortable. Why? Well, because we can hide ourselves right, in the midst of the crowd. And we are happy with our little existence. But that's not what the Christian life ought to be. You see, Jesus says that you think you gain it, you will lose it. You will lose big time. Jesus says, mark my words. But if you think that you will lose for the gospel's sake, Jesus says, you will gain. You will gain richly. And so the Lord wants us to see 
you know, his medical, mathematical formula for success. As we look at the Apostle Paul's life, how he speak those words of truth and soberness, how he will not flinch from it, even though it is going to cost him a lot, his life. He had no family. But if you have a family, you realize that the cost is not just for you, but all your family. You bear the cross. You bear the brunt of the cross. But it is a price worth paying because the Lord will reward you for your labor. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy mercy in showing to us the Apostle Paul's conviction of service, his purpose, his persuasion. Lord, may thou be gracious to give us a fervent heart for service in these last days. Lord, the time will come when we can serve thee no more. May thou be merciful to help us to serve thee with the remaining time and life that we have, that indeed our life may count for eternity. This I ask and pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.